Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd and my host. Psalm 23 is a powerful prayer of recomfort that also attracts abundance of everything including abundance of money. To all who are weary and confused and depressed, to all who are beset by obscure and hidden dangers, to all who are sick and sore and weary unto death, to all who are lonely and bereaved and forsaken, to all who are in desperate financial need, to all who have lost their way and cannot find it, to all who have come to the end of the road, here is a message for you. Like many others, this beloved psalm bears the simple title, A Psalm of David. This psalm was written by David, probably when he was a king, with vivid remembrance of his youth as a shepherd. He had been a shepherd, and he was not ashamed of his former occupation. Also, the King of the King, Jesus Christ, always uses wonderful examples from agriculture and livestock. It comes to you with supreme simplicity, but it has in it a steady, unwavering strength and power. It speaks from the lips of a plain shepherd of many years ago, but it has in it the authority of God Almighty for your life. You have spoken it many times, for the sheer beauty of its flowing speech. You shall speak it again and again for the assurance and courage and guidance that are in it for you. It is the immortal 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is one of the best known and most loved literary works in the world, and it may well be the best poem ever written. It is also a fine example of the power of figurative language. We read deep things into the vision of ourselves as sheep, led to green pastures and good water by a kind shepherd. It's empowering to feel the confidence to go fearlessly into the valley of the shadow of death, and to feel the love and caring of a table prepared by the Lord, and a cup so full that it overflows. What people don't know, however, is that this language actually has precise internal meanings, and that when we see them, there is an even deeper beauty in the poem. That's because what it actually describes is the path to heaven, and the fierce desire the Lord has to lead us there. The Psalm 23 has charmed more griefs to rest than all the philosophy of the world. It has remanded to their dungeon more felon thoughts, more black doubts, more thieving sorrows, and there are sands on the seashore. It has comforted the noble host of the poor. It has sung courage to the army of the disappointed. It has poured balm and consolation into the heart of the sick, of captives in dungeons, of widows in their pinching griefs, of orphans in their loneliness. Dying soldiers have died easier as it was read to them. Ghastly hospitals have been illuminated. It has visited the prisoner and broken his chains, and like Peter's angel, led him forth in imagination and sung him back to his home again. It has made the dying Christian slave, freer than his master, and consoled those whom dying he left behind mourning, not so much that he was gone, as because they were left behind and could not go too. Millions of people have memorized this psalm, even those who have learned few other scripture portions. Ministers have used it to comfort people who are going through severe personal trials, suffering illness, or dying. The first step is to let the Lord be our shepherd, to accept his teaching and his leadership. The green pastures and the still waters represent the things he will grant us for the journey. Then he begins working inside us, setting our spiritual lives in order, so that we desire to do what's good and to love one another. That's represented by restoring our souls and leading us in the paths of righteousness. But we will still face challenges. We still live external lives out in the world, and we are subject to desires that arise in those externals in our bodily lives. That's the valley of the shadow of death. But the rod and staff represent truth from the Lord on both external and internal levels, ideas that can defend us against those desires. And if we keep following, the Lord will prepare a table for us, a place inside us that he can fill with love, the anointing oil, and wisdom, the overflowing cup. Thus transformed, we can enter heaven with love for others, goodness and love from the Lord mercy, and can love and be loved to eternity.
One of many beautiful things about this is the fact that it is the Lord who really does all the work. In the whole text, the only action taken by the sheep is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Other than that, they follow the Lord, trust the Lord, accept the blessings of the Lord. And that is really true. In external states in the valley, we might seem to be doing the work ourselves, but internally, spiritually, we simply need to give ourselves to the Lord and let him bless us. The underlying idea here is that the Lord created us so that he could love us. In loving us, he wants us to be happy. He knows that our greatest happiness will come from being conjoined to him in heaven, and himself wants nothing more than to be conjoined to us. So everything he does, in every moment of every day, for every person on the face of the planet, is cantered on the goal of getting that person to heaven. He wants each and every one of us in heaven, more than we are capable of imagining. We just need to cooperate. Psalm 23 is undoubtedly one of the most well-known passages in scripture. It adorns walls in faithful churches and fills frames in Christian homes. David's song is portrayed in non-religious circles too, making appearances in many secular movies and other entertainment mediums. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, the song begins. For you, the harassed, discouraged one, this opening sentence of the shepherd's song holds a precious message. The Lord is your shepherd. Place your trust in God. God will lead you into your good. God will protect you and guide you. Nothing disastrous can befall you. God is mightier than any adverse circumstance or condition that confronts you. God will not desert you or forsake you or, or even forget you. Take care that you do not desert or forsake or forget God. Keep your trust in God. Even though you cannot see how God can possibly help you, be faithful to your trust. God's wisdom is greater than yours. God sees farther than you do. God knows ways that are hidden from your sight. When every way seems closed, when dangers threaten, when want looms on the horizon like some fierce wolf to slay you, remember the one who is the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd, God assures us. And I know mine own, and mine own know me. Fear not, only believe. With faith and confidence, we join in the song. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. David thought about God, the God of Israel. As he thought about his relationship with God, he made the analogy of a shepherd and his sheep. God was like a shepherd to David, and David was like a sheep to God. In one sense, this was not unusual. There are other references to this analogy between the deity and his followers in ancient Middle Eastern cultures. In all Eastern thought, and very definitely in biblical literature, a king is a shepherd. It is also a familiar idea throughout the Bible that the Lord is a shepherd to his people. The idea begins as early as the book of Genesis, where Jacob called the Lord the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Yet his bow remained steady, and his strong arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Genesis 49 verse 24. In Psalm 28 verse 9, David invited the Lord to shepherd the people of Israel and to bear them up forever. Psalm 80 verse 1 also looks to the Lord as the shepherd of Israel, who would lead Joseph like a flock. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 11 speaks of the words of the wise, which are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Isaiah 40 verse 11 tells us that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. Micah 7 verse 14 invites the Lord to shepherd your people with your staff, as in days of old. Zechariah 13 verse 7 speaks of the Messiah as the shepherd who will be struck, and the sheep scattered quoted in Matthew 26 verse 31. In John 10 verse 11 and 10 verse 14, Jesus clearly spoke of himself as the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep and who can say, I know my sheep and am known by my own. Hebrews 13 verse 20 speaks of Jesus as that great shepherd of the sheep. 1 Peter 2 verse 25 calls Jesus the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And 1 Peter 5 verse 4 calls Jesus the chief shepherd. The idea of Jesus as the good shepherd was precious to early Christians. One of the more common motifs in catacomb paintings was Jesus as a shepherd with a lamb carried across his shoulders. It's remarkable that the Lord would call himself our shepherd. In Israel, as in other ancient societies, a shepherd's work was considered the lowest of all works. If a family needed a shepherd, it was always the youngest son, like David, who got this unpleasant assignment. Jehovah has chosen to be our shepherd, David says. 
The great God of the universe has stooped to take just such care of you and me. Seth Rabbi Joseph Bar Hamna, there is not a more contemptible office than that of a shepherd. But God disdaineth not to feed his flock, to guide, to govern, to defend them, to handle and heal them, to tend and take care of them. David knew this metaphor in a unique way, having been a shepherd himself. David uses the most comprehensive and intimate metaphor yet encountered in the Psalms, preferring usually the more distant king or deliverer, or the impersonal rock, shield, etc. Whereas the shepherd lives with his flock and is everything to it. Guide, physician and protector. The Lord is my shepherd. David knew this in a personal sense. He could say, my shepherd. It wasn't just that the Lord was a shepherd for others in a theoretical sense. He was a real, personal shepherd for David himself. A sheep is an object of property, not a wild animal. Its owner sets great store by it, and frequently it is bought with a great price. It is well to know, as certainly as David did, that we belong to the Lord. There is a noble tone of confidence about this sentence. There is no if nor but nor even I hope so. But he says, the Lord is my shepherd. The sweetest word of the whole is that monosyllable, my. He does not say, the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large, and leadeth forth the multitude as his flock. But the Lord is my shepherd, if he be a shepherd to no one else, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, and preserves me. Overwhelmingly, the idea behind God's role as shepherd is of loving care and concern. David found comfort and security in the thought that God cared for him, like a shepherd cares for his sheep. David felt that he needed a shepherd. The heart of this psalm doesn't connect with the self-sufficient, but those who acutely sense their need, the poor in spirit Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount Matthew 5 verse 3, find great comfort in the idea that God can be a shepherd to them in a personal sense. Before a man can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd, he must first feel himself to be a sheep by nature, for he cannot know that God is his shepherd unless he feels in himself that he has the nature of a sheep. He must relate to a sheep in its foolishness, its dependency, and in the warped nature of its will. A sheep, saith Aristotle, is a foolish and sluggish creature aptest of anything to wander, though it feel no want, and unablest to return. A sheep can make no shift to save itself from tempests or inundation. There it stands and will perish, if not driven away by the shepherd. I shall not want. For David, the fact of God's shepherd-like care was the end of dissatisfied need. He said, I shall not want both as a declaration and as a decision. I shall not want means. All my needs are supplied by the Lord, my shepherd. It is not only I do not want, but I shall not want. Come what may, if famine should devastate the land, or calamity destroy the city, I shall not want. Old age with its feebleness shall not bring me any lack, and even death with its gloom shall not find me destitute. I have all things and abound. Not because I have a good store of money in the bank, not because I have skill and wit with which to win my bread, but because the Lord is my shepherd. The wicked always want, but the righteous never. A sinner's heart is far from satisfaction. But a gracious spirit dwells in a palace of content. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 37 verse 25 I shall not want means, I decide to not desire more than what the Lord, my shepherd, gives. Do you fear lack? Does it rear its ugly head, like a specter in your life? Follow the shepherd as he leads his sheep into places of plenty. Say with the shepherd, I shall not want. In the Orient, the hillsides become parched and dry. The grass, none too plentiful, withers in the hot sun. Many hungry sheep have roamed the same pastures. They have nibbled close down to the roots, the little grass there is. The wise shepherd knows where in times of drought, the grass is still fresh and green. He urges his charges on past the hilltops to plains and valleys of peace. Because of his wisdom, they do not lack. As familiar ground, now parched and barren, is left behind, they hesitate. But the shepherd goes ahead of them, and they follow, even though the way is strange to them. Surely it will be only a little way. But the way stretches into a long way. The sheep become hot and tired and hungry and thirsty. Still they follow, because they trust their good shepherd. At last they come to green pastures, where they may find food and rest. Our Lord is a Lord of bounty, not of lack. It is God's good pleasure to share that bounty with us. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But we must trust God and follow God.
God's way may lead us away from familiar paths that have become barren to us. The way ahead may seem even more desolate than that behind us. It is strange to us. We feel completely lost. We have no assurance of what lies in any direction. Except for the Good Shepherd, we should be lost indeed. With God we are secure. Let us keep close to God indeed. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatsoever ye will, and it shall be done unto you, God promises, and God fulfills God's promise. God brings us not only plenty, but rest from anxiety that enables us to enjoy in peace the blessings God provides. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He makes me to lie down. The Lord as a shepherd knew how to make David rest when he needed it, just as a literal shepherd would care for his sheep. The implication is that a sheep doesn't always know what it needs and what is best for itself and so needs help from the shepherd. The loveliest image afforded by the natural world is here represented to the imagination, that of a flock feeding in verdant meadows and reposing in quietness by the rivers of water running gently through them. To lie down in green pastures, the shepherd also knew the good places to make his sheep rest. He faithfully guides the sheep to green pastures. Philip Keller writes that sheep do not lie down easily and will not unless four conditions are met. Because they are timid, they will not lie down if they are afraid. Because they are social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. If flies or parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. Finally, if sheep are anxious about food or hungry, they will not lie down. Rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with fear, friction, flies and famine. In times of drought, when the hills are dry and only the tranquil hidden valleys are still green, all but the largest of the streams have dried up. The quiet little streams and the pools from which the sheep like best to drink are gone. Sheep are afraid of the rushing waters of the big streams, and well they may be, for they are easily caught in the rushing waters. The heavy wool on their backs quickly becomes saturated with water and weighs them down. Even the wise, strong shepherd may be unable to help them when they are caught in the turbulent current. This the shepherd knows even better than they. If quiet waters are still to be found, the shepherd leads them there. If not, he diverts some of the water from one of the noisy, rushing streams, so that it forms a quiet pool where the sheep may drink in safety. He leads me beside the still waters. The shepherd knows when the sheep needs green pastures, and knows when the sheep needs the still waters. The images are rich with the sense of comfort, care and rest. How grateful they are for the cool water. How fortunate to have a shepherd who is so wise and so loving. How fortunate are we to have a shepherd whose guiding care brings peace into lives that are harassed and troubled by the confusion and dangers of rushing streams of human thought. Our shepherd makes it possible for us to rest in the peace of plenty, to cleanse our world begrimed thoughts and quench our thirst for things in the still waters of peace. Surely we too can say, he leadeth me beside the still waters. The sheep didn't need to know where the green pastures or still waters were. All it needed to know was where the shepherd was. Likewise, the Lord would guide David to what he needed. What are these green pastures, but the scriptures of truth always fresh, always rich, and never exhausted? There is no fear of biting the bare ground where the grass is long enough for the flock to lie down in it. Sweet and full are the doctrines of the gospel, fit food for souls, as tender grass is natural nutriment for sheep. What are these still waters, but the influences and graces of his blessed spirit? His spirit attends us in various operations, like waters in the plural to cleanse, to refresh, to fertilize, to cherish. They are still waters, for the Holy Ghost loves peace, and sounds no trumpet of ostentation in his operations. Not to raging waves of strife, but to peaceful streams of holy love, does the Spirit of God conduct the chosen sheep. He is a dove, not an eagle. The dew, not the hurricane. He restores my soul. The tender care of the shepherd described in the previous verse had its intended effect. David's soul was restored by the figurative green pastures and still waters the shepherd brought him to. Restores has the idea of the rescue of a lost one. It may picture the straying sheep brought back. In Hebrew the words restores my soul can mean brings me to repentance or conversion. He restoreth my soul. He restores it to its original purity that was now grown foul and black with sin. For also, what good were it to have green pastures and a black soul? He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. 
Are you weary and confused? Do you seem to have been left behind in the swift onward rush of things and events? Look again to the shepherd. Sometimes the march over the hillsides is a long one. The sheep are hot and dusty and weary. They are hungry and thirsty. Some of them, the weaker ones, lag behind. The wise shepherd calls a halt while they rest. And if some poor sheep is especially weak and wobbly, he takes it in his arms and carries it a while. As the others resume the onward march, his clear voice rings with encouragement, and the patient sheep respond to his call. Soon they come to green pastures and still waters. Truly he restores not only the soul, but also the body of his charges. So does the master bid us pause in the onward rush of things, to renew our strength and faith, to make a fresh start. We feel the steadying influence of God's presence. God's words ring softly upon our inner ears. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And we whisper, God restoreth my soul. All day long, the shepherd goes before his flock, choosing a way for them to go. He picks a path where rocks are fewest, lest they dash their feet against a stone. He prods in the grass with his staff to force out any snake that may be frightened into biting the ankles of the sheep as they pass, and to disclose hidden gopher holes that may cause the sheep to stumble and fall. He leads them by the best way that he can find, for his name's sake as a good shepherd. It might seem to the sheep that another way would be better or quicker, for they are impatient to reach a place of food and rest, but he knows better than they. He is their guardian, and must guard them from themselves, as well as from outside dangers. How much more so does the Good Shepherd guard and guide us? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. They are thenceforth led in the path of righteousness, in the way of holy obedience. Obstructions are removed, they are strengthened, to walk and run in the paths of God's commandments. For his name's sake, the shepherd guides the sheep with an overarching view to the credit and glory of the shepherd's own name, to display the glory of his grace, and not on account of any merit in me. God's motives of conduct towards the children of men are derived from the perfections and goodness of his own nature, the gift of the shepherd's presence. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shadow of death is ever upon the sheep, death from tooth and claw, skulking in the distance, waiting to rush and kill, death from cruel fang darting from the grass, death from hole and pit open to trap slender feet and legs, death from rushing water, reaching with greedy fingers to catch and carry downstream, the luckless animal, whose thirst overbalances his judgment, winged death soaring overhead to swirl upon the young and helpless, the old and weak. With the sturdy shepherd at hand, all this is changed. The timid sheep, so easily panicked without their guardian, are calmed and guided by his reassuring presence. Yes, even though they walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, they fear no evil, for he is with them. His rod and his staff are ever ready to protect them. They are comforted. Wise is the human who has an equal faith, who knows that even death itself is only a shadow, and that beyond the shadow and all around it is light, the light of eternal life. Conscious of an abiding presence, whose nature is life, that is the light of humans. Then the human says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. In our shepherd's hands, to defend and protect us, is a rod of power, and a staff of support. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is the first dark note in this beautiful psalm. Previously David wrote of green pastures and still waters and paths of righteousness. Yet when following the Lord as shepherd, one may still walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This valley is a very solitary place. The prophet Jeremiah thus describes it as a wilderness, a land of deserts and of pits, a land of drought and of the shadow of death, a land that no man but a Christian passed through and where no man dwelt. We read in Jeremiah 2 verse 6. They did not ask, where is the Lord, who brought us up out of Egypt, and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? The Wadi Kelt is a deep gorge in the Judean wilderness that runs from Jerusalem down to Jericho. The area is one of the places likely considered to be the setting for the Valley of the Shadow of Death in this Psalm 23 verse 4 mentioned above. A dark valley connects much better with sheep lying down in green pastures 
and beside quiet waters. However, the main point of walking through the valley of the shadow of death still definitely applies to death. Many people fear death, and those facing death certainly feel as if they are in a dark valley. But even in death, we do not need to fear, for God is with us, and he will protect and comfort us through it all. David used this powerful phrase to speak of some kind of dark, fearful experience. It is an imprecise phrase, yet its poetry makes perfect sense. It is a valley, not a mountaintop or broad meadow. A valley suggests being hedged in and surrounded. It is a valley of the shadow of death, not facing the substance of death itself, but the shadow of death, casting its dark, fearful outline across David's path. It is a valley of the shadow of death, facing what seemed to David as the ultimate defeat and evil. This line is especially suggestive when we read this psalm with an eye toward Jesus, the Great Shepherd. We understand that a shadow is not tangible, but is cast by something that is. One can rightly say that we face only the shadow of death because Jesus took the full reality of death in our place. This psalm as a whole has proven itself precious to many and dying saints through the ages. They have been comforted, strengthened, and warmed by the thought that the Lord would shepherd them through the valley of the shadow of death. Near death, the saint still calmly walks, he does not need to quicken his pace in alarm or panic. Near death, the saint does not walk in the valley, but through the valley. Death in its substance has been removed, and only the shadow of it remains. Nobody is afraid of a shadow, for a shadow cannot stop a man's pathway, even for a moment. The shadow of a dog cannot bite, the shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. It has an inexpressibly delightful application to the dying, but it is for the living too. The words are not in the future tense and therefore are not reserved for a distant moment. I will fear no evil. Despite every dark association with the idea of the valley of the shadow of death, David could resolutely say this because he was under the care of the Lord his shepherd. Even in a fearful place, the presence of the shepherd banished the fear of evil. We might say that the shepherd's presence did not eliminate the presence of evil, but certainly the fear of evil. For you are with me. This emphasizes that it is the presence of the shepherd that eliminated the fear of evil for the sheep. No matter his present environment, David could look to the fact of God's shepherd-like presence and know, you are with me and I will fear no evil. In Hosea 13 verse 14 we read, I will redeem them from the power of the abode of the dead, and deliver them from death. O dead, where is thy plague? Home of the dead, where is your destruction? Significantly, it is at the dangerous moment pictured in the psalm, that the he of Psalm 23 verse 1 to 3, changes to you. The Lord as shepherd is now in the second person. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff were instruments used by a shepherd. The idea is of a sturdy walking stick, used to gently as much as possible guide the sheep and protect them from potential predators. There is some debate among commentators as to whether David had the idea of two separate instruments, the rod and the staff, or one instrument used two ways. The Hebrew word for rod shebet here seems to simply mean a stick with a variety of applications. The Hebrew word for staff mishenor seems to speak of a support in the sense of a walking stick. The rod, a cudgel worn at the belt and staff to walk with, and to round up the flock with a shepherd's weapon and the former for defense and the latter for control since discipline is security. The rod and the staff seem to be two names for one instrument which was used both to beat off predatory animals and to direct the sheep. These instruments of guidance were a comfort to David. It helped him even in the valley of the shadow of death to know that God guided him even through correction. It is a great comfort to know that God will correct us when we need it. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. The Lord is host. We have blessing even in the presence of danger. You prepare a table before me. Without departing from the previous picture of the valley of the shadow of death, David envisioned the provision and goodness given by the Lord as a host, inviting David to a rich table prepared for him. Here the second allegory begins. A magnificent banquet is provided by a most liberal and benevolent host, who has not only the bounty to feed me, but power to protect me. And though surrounded by enemies, I sit down to this table with confidence, knowing that I shall feast in perfect security. The hillsides and valleys and tablelands are the table of the sheep, spread with food and drink for them. 
The tables of their masters are not unlike their own. For in nomadic countries, humans commonly spread a skin upon the ground before the door of their tent, and placing on it their simple foods, they squat upon the ground around it and eat. Often both their own and their master's meal is in the presence of enemies, wild animals who, emboldened by hunger, may attack, and sometimes thieves who live from the spoil of other men's labor. The shepherd prepares a table before the sheep, truly in the presence of their enemies. David gives a beautiful picture. Table suggests bounty. Prepare suggests foresight and care. Before me suggests the personal connection. In the presence of my enemies, this is a striking phrase. The goodness and care suggested by the prepared table is set right in the midst of the presence of my enemies. The host's care and concern doesn't eliminate the presence of my enemies, but enables the experience of God's goodness and bounty, even in their midst. This is the condition of God's servant, always conflict, but always a spread table. The sun has set. The flock is safely in its fold. Its low murmurings have hushed to quiet. Twilight deepens into night, velvet soft and darkest blue. A light twinkles in the window of the herdsman's home, beckoning him a welcome. Overhead the steadfast stars appear. Within us you and me, something of the serene faith and courage of the shepherd's day is born anew, and something of the calm peace of the starlit night. We have found a strong and gentle presence, the Lord who is our shepherd, and as we turn once again from the sweet simplicity of the shepherd's song to the challenge and activity of our own busy days, the closing words of the singer of Israel echo in our hearts. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When a soldier is in the presence of his enemies, if he eats at all, he snatches a hasty meal, and away he hastens to the fight. But observe, thou preparest a table, just as a servant does when she unfolds the damask cloth and displays the ornaments of the feast on an ordinary peaceful occasion. Nothing is hurried, there is no confusion, no disturbance, the enemy is at the door, and yet God prepares a table, and the Christian sits down and eats, as if everything were in perfect peace. Humans often feel today that they are surrounded by persons and circumstances and events that are adverse to their best interest. It sometimes seems to them as if all life is a kind of conspiracy against them, separating them from all they want to possess or achieve, and in the fell clutch of circumstance, they do not always clearly know the shepherd's guidance, or hear God's gentle voice amid the din of other voices. Good then, it is to know and to affirm. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My trust is in thee. We come now to the closing lines of the shepherd's immortal song, and to the closing scenes in the shepherd's day. From dawn until sunset, he has trudged the hills and valleys with them, going before them, making their way safe and plain and easy, finding them food, guarding them against dangers both imaginary and real, bringing them safely home again. Now, as the sheep return to the fold, comes the most beautiful scene of all. The shepherd stands guard at the entrance to the fold. He has a dipper of olive oil, and another, brimful of cool water by his side. He examines the sheep as they enter. If he finds a bruise or cut, he cleanses it and binds it up with a healing ointment. His quick eye and gentle hands seek out the weariest animals, a ewe heavy with young, or a lamb that is still none too steady on its wobbly legs. He refills his cup of water and lets the tired animal drink its fill. He anoints the hot dusty head, bramble torn as well perhaps with the healing olive oil, and sends the poor beast onto its night of rest. Not until the last of his charges is safely cared for and the door of the fold closed and barred, does he retire to his own refreshment. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, Despite the dangers about and the presence of enemies, David enjoyed the richness of his host's goodness. He was refreshed by a head anointed with oil. His cup was overfilled. Beloved, I will ask you now a question. How would it be with you if God had filled your cup in proportion to your faith? How much would you have had in your cup? Those that have this happiness must carry their cup upright and see that it overflows into their poor brethren's empty vessels. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The blessing for the future. The host's care brought the goodness and mercy of God to David, and he lived in the faithful expectation of it, continuing all the days of his life. 
Mercy is the covenant word rendered steadfast love elsewhere. Together with goodness, it suggests the steady kindness and support that one can count on in the family or between firm friends. The psalm ends with the calmest assurance that he would enjoy the presence of the Lord forever, both in his days on this earth and beyond. You are discouraged and disheartened, you say. You are pressed from every side by demands greater than your strength. You are called on to make decisions for which you have not the needed wisdom. You have sought vainly among all the persons you know, for one clear voice that will set you right, that will tell you what to do. It is then, after you leave this valley, you will find his holy table. The table that illustrates abundance, satisfaction, and everlasting love. God's people can feast at his table of endless love and grace, and no enemy of any sort can ever take it away. Your enemies can only feel annoyed that you were victorious and prosperous in spite of them. To reiterate the point, the psalmist reminds us of valleys and God's table again, in Psalm 118, verse 5 to 6. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And in the New Testament, Peter says it again in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Thou hast provided for me all things pertaining both to life and godliness, all things requisite both for body and soul, for time and eternity. Don't give in to Satan's lies and tricks. Continue walking with God until you reach his holy table. It is there you will find what you're looking for in great abundance, his provision and ultimate satisfaction. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? But God doesn't stop there. This psalm is known world over for its divine power, particularly in times of great duress and when in need of healing. Whether you are suffering from a broken or troubled heart, lack of money or prosperity, in case of anxiety, depression, illness, sin, loss, or other physical or spiritual battles, this divinely inspired Psalm 23 of David will offer you much comfort and strength. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, share and subscribe to our channel, and ring the bell to be notified of new videos available. To the next video.